thank you for tuning in this morning. A few weeks ago, I started a series on divine healing, and I'm going to be covering a lot of scripture verses today because I want to cover every aspect of this teaching so that when the series is over, you will know that you know that you know that Jesus not only came to forgive us our sins, but he came so that we can walk in divine health every day of our lives. If you have your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 9. This is a story about a sick man. His friends want to bring him to see Jesus. Now, you know, whenever anybody tried to see Jesus, there were multitudes following him, and it was hard to get there. So their friends took this sick man, brought him up on the roof, and led him down right in the middle of the synagogue where Jesus is teaching. And now all the Pharisees are standing there, and they're watching him. And it says, And behold, certain of the Pharisees said within themselves, This man blasphemes. Now the reason that they said he was blaspheming is because Jesus said to the sick man, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins be forgiven you. But notice, they didn't say anything out loud. They were saying it inside of themselves. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, looks at them and says, Why do you think evil in your hearts? What's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk. In other words, it was just as easy for, for Jesus to say one thing as it was the other. You know what was easier for these men to say? Your sins are forgiven you. They said it all the time. If someone said, oh, Rabbi, you're so wonderful, your sins are forgiven you. If somebody gave big in the offering, your sins are forgiven you. Can you imagine the blaspheme of these men? But they could no more forgive sins than they can get someone healed. Only Jesus could say, one is as easy as the other. Now look at verse 6. It says, But that you might know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up your bed, and go into your house. And he arose and departed to his house. Jesus said, I'm going to prove to you I can forgive sins. Get up and walk. So outward divine healing is proof that Jesus can forgive sins. You know why? Because in conquering sin at its root, you'll conquer sickness because sickness is a byproduct of sin entering into this earth. Remember, it was Adam and Eve who sinned. So when we're born, babies don't sin, but the sin nature is there. We have the ability as we get older to sin. In Romans 5, 12, it says, Wherefore, as by, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. He's saying sickness is a, is a part of death. But when Jesus came to conquer, he conquered not only physical, but spiritual death as well. And he did it by his work on the cross. Now, the last time we had talked about the word salvation and the word healing, the Greek word is the word sozo. It's the same word. And do you remember when Jesus said, oh, all who call upon the Lord will be saved? That's the word sozo. In Mark chapter 5, when Jesus spoke to the woman with the issue of blood, he said, Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Uh, be in peace and go and be whole of that plague. That word whole is the same word, sozo. It means divine healing, sickness, and disease. So if there's no connection between healing and the removal of sin, why is the same word used for both? Now, the last time we read Isaiah 53, we said the Hebrew word for sorrow and grief is the word sickness and disease. I'm going to read Isaiah 53, but I'm going to read this from the Message Bible. It says, Who believes what we've heard and seen? Who would have thought God's saving power would look like this? A servant grew up before God, a scrawny seedling, a scrubby plant in a parched field. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing to cause us to take a second look. He was looked down on and passed over, a man who suffered, who knew pain firsthanded. One look at him, and people turned away. We looked down on him, thought he was scum. But the fact is, it was our pains he carried, our disfigurements, all the things wrong with us. We thought he brought it on himself, that God was punishing him for his own failures. But it was our sins that did that to him, that ripped and tore and crushed him. Our sins. He looked, he took the punishment that made us whole. Through his bruises, we get healed. 
Saints, you have to be crazy not to believe that God wants us healed. Jesus knew now that there was going to be a lot of controversy that would come out of that passage, passage of Scripture. So he gave us divine commentary on it. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 6, it says, Lord, my servant might have been home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Now this is talking about demon possession as well as a physical sickness. In verse 17, it says, that it might be fulfilled that which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Notice Jesus pulls out verses 3 and 4 that have to do with sickness and disease. He didn't pull out verse 5 that deals with sin. He was showing them what we talked about last time when we take communion. We take one element at a time. First, we take the bread, and that's representative of his broken body. And then we take the cup for remission of sins. I mean, aren't you glad he took our pains to the cross? Aren't you glad when a symptom comes along on your body, just like a temptation, we could bring it back to the cross? We should be so grateful because he not only promised he would heal us, but he also said that we could walk in divine health. He not only uh, uh, would forgive our sins, but he said we could walk a sanctified life. Now, if we could do all this on the salvation side, why can't we do this on the healing side? How many of you ever had a day where you just kind of feel so far from God, you almost wish you could get born again again because on that day there was such joy and peace and happiness? You just feel that God's not close enough to you, but yet we know he'll never leave us or forsake us. And we know that we're saved because we believe the message of the gospel. And we don't walk by our feelings. We walk by the written word. So you need to receive what is yours by faith. Peter received God's message of the gospel that was prophesied by Isaiah. How did he receive it? He received it by faith. Don't forget, Peter wasn't there when Isaiah prophesied Yet Peter himself said in 1 Peter 2.24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. So Peter not only said it, he showed it in Acts chapter 3. Remember when they came back down from the upper room? They were endued with power. In Acts 2.46, it says, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all men. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now go over to Acts chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. It says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered the temple. So every day, this lame man was brought to the temple, he would lay at the gate, and he would beg people for money. And now he sees Peter and John going into the temple, and he's asking them for money. And it says, Peter, fastening his eyes upon him, said, look on us. And the lame man looks at them, thinking he's going to receive some money. And Peter says, no, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, I give unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, lifted him up. The Bible says immediately he had strength in his ankles and in his feet. See, what happened was this lame man, too, believed in the truth of the word of God. And this is what we need to do as believers. We need to sanctify our thought life. We need to believe the truth of God's word when we read it. So again, healing is part of the atonement. You can't have one part without the other. When Jesus went to the cross, he not only conquered sin, he conquered sickness at its root because without sin, there would be no sickness. Sin was the doorway for death. Not only spiritual, but natural death. In other words, sickness will speed up the death process. Now go over to Matthew chapter 8. Jesus is going to commend a man for having great faith, but he's going to compare him to another man who had strong faith. In Matthew 8, verse 1, it says, And when he came down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. 
Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately the leper was cleansed. This leper represented the multitude. Because notice he said, Lord, I know you can make me clean, but will you make me clean? And this is the same question people have today. Some people say, Lord, I know you can, but they doubt the fact that he will heal them. And the reason for this is because if God can heal, then they don't need any faith of their own. Then it's all up to God. And that only happens when the gifts of healing are in operation, which is talked about in Corinthians, because that's as the Spirit wills. See, when the gifts are, operation, are in operation, you don't have to have any faith at all. In fact, you don't even have to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Now, some people may feel that they may not be one of the fortunate ones that God wants to heal. But again, notice the leper. He comes down from the mountain and says, Are you willing? That's all he wanted to know. Are you willing to heal me? Jesus couldn't wait to show him the willing part. Now notice this leper, he didn't ask about God's ability. Again, he wants to know about the willing part so much, but Jesus wants to show him as he's saying, I will. His hand is already going out and touching the man, and immediately the leprosy was cleansed. Now look at verse 5. It says, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him, a centurion beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Notice, this man is being tormented. The first two words out of Jesus' mouth is, I will. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. Just speak the word and my servant will be healed because I'm a man under authority. I tell this one to go, and he goes, this one to come, and he come, and this one to do this, and he does it. It says, when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great, great a faith, not even in Israel. Notice, this is a centurion. He doesn't understand Jewish law, but he understood authority. And Jesus said, you know what, I've looked for this kind of faith among my own, and I couldn't find it. I had to find this and a Roman soldier, a Roman who doesn't even know the Old Testament. You see, Jesus came for his own, but what he found was a bunch of stiff-necked, rebellious people who thought because they were Jews, they were going to heaven. Now, this story is repeated again in Luke chapter 7, and when you read it, it looks like the Bible contradicts itself because in Matthew it says the centurion came to Jesus himself. But in Luke, it says the centurion sent the elders. But you have to understand something. At that time, in those days, if you sent someone in your name, it was as good as if you went yourself. So I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you know whose name you've been sent in? Jesus said in John 13, 20, He that receives whoever I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. In chapter 14 of Matthew, it talks about how Herod had John the Baptist murdered. It says in verse 34, And they came into the land of Genesaret. And when the man of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out unto all the country round about, and brought unto him all that were diseased, and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made perfectly whole. In Matthew 9, Verse 20, and behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood uh, for 12 years came up behind him and touched the hem of his garment. So we see this woman touching the hem of his garment as well as the others who were diseased touching the hem of his garment. So what was it about the hem of his garment? That word hem in, in the Greek is called kraspidon. It's a tassel of twisted wool. Now remember the Pharisees wore those long robes, and at the end of all four corners, there was one tassel, and it represented a, a mark of sanctity. You could read this for yourself in Numbers chapter 15. But it was part of a covenant. One tassel of each of them had to be a deep blue to remind them to keep the law. So the woman with the issue of blood, as well as the others, they knew that this tassel represented the word of God. It, was, it stood for the covenant of healing 
that the word and the word that would heal all of Israel. So they acted on their faith. Back in the 1950s, uh, Brother Oral Roberts was used tremendously by God for healing. Now the full gospel church has put on a crusade, and they asked Oral Roberts if he would um, if he would teach at this at this uh, crusade. Now there were many many people from all denominations. At the end, when he prayed for everyone, they were given a little card, and they had to fill out their name, their address, and the denomination. They were given the card, and on the back of it, they were given half. They were given a copy, and the and the counselor kept the other half. They were told on the back was two more questions. Number one, did you receive healing the day you were prayed for? And number two, do you still have your healing? And they were told, hold the cards for about four months and then send them back. At the end of four months, 6,000 cards came back. 10% were from all the people from the full gospel churches. Every single one came back and said, yes, I received healing the day I was prayed for. And almost everyone that came back said, no, I don't have my healing any longer. All the rest of the cards that came back from the other denominations, Catholic, Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutheran, everyone came back and said, yes, I received healing the day I was prayed for, and yes, I still have my healing. So what happened? What happened was the Catholics, the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, the Methodists, they went to a meeting because they were told, there's a man there named Oral Roberts. God uses him to heal people. That's where their level of faith was. All the full gospel people, They've been hearing that word over and over and over. They're being taught, so it required them to use faith on their own part. That says they really didn't have much faith. Now you might say, well, they lost their healing. Is that fair? Yeah, it was. Because too much is given, much more is required. I mean, you wouldn't expect the same thing from a four-year-old that you would a 14-year-old. Isn't that right? So when the word of God is being taught, or when... You read the word of God. Ask God to heal that, to heal and, and seal that word rather in your heart. Don't let the enemy tell you that it's not for today. So what if you need to get medical attention? Go, get the medical attention. It doesn't mean the word of God doesn't work. It does. Healing is the children's bread. It belongs to us. Learn to stand on the word of God and make it final authority to settle every question that arises in your mind. Amen? So, I'm going to give you an opportunity. If you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, bow your heads, close your eyes. This is between you and God. Just say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. I believe you died for my justification. And today, I make you the Lord of my life. Now, if you pray that for the first time, I'm telling you, the angels in heaven are rejoicing, and you can expect to see miracles happen in your life. And may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you, lift up his countenance, and give you peace. Amen.